All right. Chapter 27. The Empire. The title of chapter 27 is The Empire and Expansion. Okay, so there was this idea going around um, that in order to stop the inequity, inequities in, during the Gilded Age and the, you know, um, rich versus poor, and there are so many, poor, the rich were such a small amount and the poor and the common man were, you know, obviously a huge, there was a huge dis, dis, uh, discrepancy between the rich and the poor. So there was this idea of expand or explode, explode meaning revolution that, you know, that Marx, when he wrote his communist manifesto saying that um, the lower class will eventually rise up against the upper class, it's inevitable. Uh, they're trying to find solutions to that in the United States that, that, you know, expansion might be the answer to preventing explosion. So from the end of the Civil War to the 1880s, the United States was very isolationist. They, they stayed on their side of the ocean and they they didn't do much when it comes to expansion. They just kind of existed. But things are changing in the 1890s as this expand idea started to take hold. So uh, factories are, are booming. You know, they're producing goods at an all time high. We're the number one manufacturer in the world. So people started talking about foreign markets the value of foreign markets. We're finally in a place to be able to get pa past this idea that, you know, you had to have a high protective tariff so Americans could buy American. But what happens if you have a low protective tariff and you trade with other countries and other countries buy your goods? Isn't the world a bigger market than just the United States? So they started thinking along other lines. Maybe the answer isn't to jack up the tariff. Maybe the answer is foreign markets. So sometimes expansion meant taking over countries. And we'll talk about Hawaii, we'll talk about Cuba. Sometimes it meant just finding future trade partners that you could send goods to who will buy your product and, and uh, benefit your factories. There was this idea that the safety valve theory was not Frederick Jackson Turner's frontier theory, but maybe it was foreign markets that that would be what prevents it from explosion. The safe, this is the new modern safety valve theory at the turn of the century. Um, what's really gonna benefit this are newspapers. Yellow journalism is um, exaggerated uh, stories that are just, you know, sometimes they're made up, sometimes they're not, but it's the use of the media to, to uh, create, interest in the public and and two authors we'll be talking about William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer are going to be champions at yellow journalism and it's all going to come from the desire to sell more newspapers right they're they're competing against each other in New York so they're they're sending out these sensationalized stories trying to get people to purchase their to pay that dime and purchase their newspaper uh, the idea of anglo-saxon superiority that we believed that we were right and that we had might and that we were gonna expand our influence, Anglo-Saxon superiority. We, 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 uh, there's a lot of people in the United States that believe that at this time. Uh, and then the aggressive leadership of people like Theodore Roosevelt and Henry Cabot Lodge who promoted expansion. Uh, we'll be talking about a lot about Theodore Roosevelt in this chapter. And then the, uh, the idea of Darwinism that hey, if you're bigger and stronger than everybody else that you're, you just take what you deserve, um, you know, the whole survival of the fittest, we're stronger than everybody else, so deal with it type attitude. Then you had authors like Alfred Thayer Mahan who wrote a book that was very influential and read by people like Theodore Roosevelt and he talked about the influence of sea power upon history, building up a big strong Navy to protect your interests. And then the idea of just keeping up with the Joneses. Other countries like Great Britain are doing it, so why don't we do it? Keeping up with the Joneses. So, you know, a lot of reasons why uh, this expand or explode idea was really being promoted at the time. Um, nothing says it better than this, this uh, political cartoon right here. It depicts the United States at different stages of their development. And it's pro 
expansion. In the title, you could see here is a lesson for anti-expansion. It's because there were people out there who said we shouldn't be doing this. We should just concentrate on us. So looking here in 1783, um, at 1783, at the end of the um, Revolutionary War, um, new country, infant years. And then we're starting to grow up in 1883 with the Louisiana Purchase, starting to, to grow. And then here you have 1819, the Treaty of 1819, where we, one of the treaties, we took Florida. 1861, you know, you had 34 states, tech, Texas uh, annexation was in effect big time. And that happened in the 1840s. But the Civil War, this is like right before the Civil War. Things kind of went bad uh, during the Civil War, but that's not reflected in this political cartoon, of course. And then 1898, uh, the year we took Hawaii, 1899, one year later with the uh, victory in the Spanish-American War, and we're taking Cuba and the Philippines, and we're big, and we have uh, Uncle Sam has a, a ship underneath one arm, and everybody wants to shake his hand and France and Great Britain and all these countries want to shake our hand. To be big was to be uh, very rich and was looked upon as a sign of wealth if you were very heavy like Uncle Sam is at this time when this cartoon was created in 1899. So definitely pro-expansion. There's William Randolph Hearst of local fame here. He built uh, Hearst Castle down San Simeon, not too far away from here a couple hours south um, with all the money that he made, the profits that he made from the newspaper business. He built Hearst Castle along with another uh, even bigger, more magnificent home in New York. Uh, and then you had Joseph Pulitzer who, uh, you know, they own the, you know, the competing newspaper in New York. And again, they, these two competed for business with each other and they created wars when there was none and one of them being the Spanish-American War. And here's Alfred Thayer Mahan, the author who wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon History and he's the one that actually promoted the building of the Panama Canal years before um, they actually started digging the Panama Canal. Hawaii, uh, you know how strategic Hawaii will be uh, to the United States. It's a halfway, not quite halfway, but uh, a stop off point between uh, Asia and the United States. It's very uh, good harbor. If you've ever been to Pearl Harbor, you know what I'm talking about. It's wide, it's deep, it could fit a lot of ships. And, you know, and then the produce that comes out of there, the pineapples and sugarcane and all that made it a very, very lucrative uh, target for the United States. We're not the only country that wanted to take over Hawaii, but we were the ones that took it. If you visit Hawaii, you could see there's the Arizona that sits at the bottom uh, of Pearl Harbor after it was bombed by the Japanese on December 7th, 1941. We'll talk about that more in class and we'll also talk about it uh, when we get to World War II and you could see the, the oil that still leaks out of the Arizona and will continue for many, many years. Um, it's still, that's how much oil these ships contain. Uh, this is Queen Lilia Wakalani, and she was the leader of, of Hawaii at the time. Uh, and, you know, sugar was a big product coming out of Hawaii, very uh, highly sought after um, produce, uh, produce item. Uh, and then things started to go bad in 1890 with the McKinley tariff that jacked up the price of uh, sugar coming out of Hawaii, so le less less uh, people were buying it and uh, things started to go bad in Hawaii for the Hawaiian people. In 1893, America troops landed on Hawaii and removed Queen Lilia Wakalani from power. And we took it in 1893. And uh, then Grover Cleveland became president the next year. And being a Democrat and being a guy who wasn't for expansion, investigated the coup and found that it was wrong. And we returned the island back to Lilia Wakalani. Uh, but then again, um, in 1899, we took it over a second time. That in that time, that then it was permanent. Uh, it was when McKinley was president, and uh, you know we just went in there and we took over basically financially. We, we not a shot was fired, but 
we controlled the produce and therefore controlled the island and uh, took over. Sanford Dole was named president of the uh, Commonwealth. It's not a state, doesn't become a state until 1959, but it's the first imperialistic debate in history. I don't know if I call it that. Imperialism is the taking over of other countries. And, uh, you know, I mean, we, there's a debate over the Louisiana purchase but I don't know if you'd really call that imperialism. This time we're venturing out away from mainland United States and taking territory. And everybody's saying at the time, is that right? Should we be doing it? Should we uh, expand beyond our borders? I mean, who knew that Manifest Destiny was not just sea to shining sea, but it was beyond. So there was a debate about it, but we ended up taking Hawaii and it was ours um, and still is obviously. Okay, let's talk about Cuba. Cuba is a country that is controlled by Spain. Cuba is located 90 miles. It's only 90 miles off the coast of Florida. I know I've said that before. And once again, you have a country, Cuba, that's being hurt by the fact that the United States is not buying a lot of their sugar um, that's coming out of there because of tariffs. And uh, they, they are frustrated by that. Plus, the Cubans were very frustrated by the fact that they were being controlled by the Spanish. They didn't like that. Uh, they wanted to be a free and independent country. The Cubans claim that the Spanish were committing atrocities against them. So they uh, instituted what became known as a scorched earth policy. They just started burning the sugarcane fields um, and, and said, we're just gonna burn fields. And well, the Spanish didn't like that. They sent a guy there by the name of General, they called him Butcher Whaler. He set up concentration camps and he put Cubans who got in trouble in these concentration camps. Um, Cuba was pleading with the United States to intervene and help them out. Uh, at the time, Cleveland was president, and, and we know that Grover Cleveland is anti-war. Uh, he would be considered to be, at the time, an anti-jingo. A jingo was a term that was thrown around during the at the turn of the century, late 1800s, early 1900s. A jingo was pro-war, pro-expansion. Cleveland was anti-war, anti-expansion. You saw that reflected in the give back of Hawaii. Um, so, you know, he kind of didn't do anything when it came to Cuba. But once McKinley comes into power, uh, he, the, the, everything changes. I mean, McKinley was the one who, who uh, approved the takeover, the retakeover of Hawaii. And now Yellow Journalism is getting involved and they're starting to talk about what's going on in Cuba. And they're writing about the Spanish atrocities against the Cubans. So Americans who could relate to a country fighting for their independence because it wasn't that long ago that we were fighting for our independence in 1776. So there was a lot of uh, sympathy toward the Cuban people. Uh, we actually did send a ship down there called the Maine to Havana Harbor, Harbor to watch over the Cubans in hopes of, um, you know, preventing the, the Spanish from, um, you know, committing the atrocities. And uh, that, that ship blew up in the harbor. Immediately, Americans blamed the Spanish. They said it was the work of the Spanish. It was a mine that, that uh, blew up the ship. Uh, the newspapers got involved. So the yellow journalism kicked in and people were furious. Frederick Remington is going to uh, paint some uh, patriotic paintings uh, that, that reflect American pride and people started really buying into that. He was actually uh, painting for the newspapers too and they would put his paintings in there so people could see it. Uh, and then you had a, a Spanish ambassador in the United States, his last name was Delome and he wrote a letter criticizing President McKinley, calling him a crowd pleaser. I mean, I know we call our presidents a lot worse than crowd pleasers this day and age, but back then there was this anger directed at Spain anyway because of what they were doing to the Cubans and because the, the Maine had blown up and people were just really angry. So they reacted to DeLome's letter, maybe even overreacted, and the people started to push for war against Spain. Come to find out that this ship, the Maine, on the left here, here's an artist's depiction of it in a newspaper. You have blood in the water and people flying all over the place. It was tragic and there were people that died. Um, but they really kind of sensationalized this whole thing. When push comes to shove, it was an internal engine explosion and had nothing to do with a mine. 
but they didn't find that out till later on. So the people all believed it was the work of the enemy and you could see the newspapers really saying it was, it was that. So Theodore Roosevelt, who was the assistant secretary of the Navy at the time, the assistant secretary of the Navy, not even the secretary of the Navy, he called McKinley a wimp, basically. He said the white livered occupant of the White House doesn't have the backbone of a chocolate eclair. So yeah, that's what he's basically saying about the president, that he's a wimp. And Theodore Roosevelt is joining yellow journalism and Remington and the uh, people that are pushing for war. He wants war. So the Spanish-American War is going to start. Theodore Roosevelt is going to play a big part in bringing on the Spanish-American War. He is going to be the, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, your job becomes Secretary of Navy in the absence of the Secretary. So the Secretary was on leave for a week. Theodore Roosevelt was the Acting Secretary of Navy, and he dispatched the Navy, led by G Commodore George Dewey, to the, to the Philippines to attack the Spanish. The, the Spanish also, you might ask, well, why the Philippines? I thought this was about Cuba. Yes, it was, but it's more about the Spanish. The Spanish own the Philippines as well. So, you know, this could have been looked at, if the, if the Americans would have lost, say, in, in uh, the Philippines, it would have been, you know, the end of, the career, of a career for Theodore Roosevelt. But we all know it's not going to be the end of the of a career for Theodore Roosevelt. It was a pretty good bet that the Americans were going to win in the Philippines simply because the Americans had steel ships and the Spanish still had wooden ships. So it was like a no brainer that Americans were going to win. The American troops were helped by a man by the name of Emilio Aguinaldo, who uh, gave them information uh, about what what was going on with the Spanish. He was a Filipino who helped the Americans. And, uh, you know, they're able to, to defeat the Spanish in the Philippines. We, before we started this war, we passed in Congress what's called the Teller Amendment. Make sure you know that. The Teller Amendment proclaimed that when the U.S. had overthrown Spanish rule, it would give the Cubans their freedom. So alerting the Cubans that, look, we're not in this to take over Cuba, we will give you your freedom and independence eventually. So the Teller Amendment. Let's talk a little bit about the Rough Riders, an interesting group in history that was the brainchild of Theodore Roosevelt. The Rough Riders were headed by Colonel Leonard Wood, a distinguished army doctor and Medal of Honor recipient. The regiment was actually the brainchild of Theodore Roosevelt, Assistant Secretary of the Navy and Wood's friend. Roosevelt, realizing his own lack of military experience, suggested Wood for the command. Theodore Roosevelt had, um, had really bad eyesight. I mean, if he didn't have his glasses on, he'd be declared legally blind. When he had his glasses on, he could see, but still not very well. That's why he never was in the Navy or the Army. He always wanted to be in the military, but he never could because of that, um, because of his eyesight. Uh, the Rough Riders, as the regiment was soon known, comprised of 1,250 men, including cowboys, Indians, and Eastern college athletes, rowers, people who would row. That was a big um, sport during that time. Despite their dissimilar, and football players too, by the way, despite their dissimilarities, they were in excellent physical condition. The Rough Riders departed from Tampa, Florida, uh, for San Juan, Cuba in mid-June without their horses. Immediately prior to the conflict at San Juan, Colonel Wood was uh, promoted to another field command, enabling Teddy Roosevelt as a full colonel to take command of the Rough Riders. On July 1st, Roosevelt, having secured a horse, led his forces in a charge up Kettle Hill outside of Santiago. They achieved their goal and later in the day participated in the victory at San Juan Hill. More than one third of the Rough, rough Riders were casualties in the Spanish-American War, a fact that has led some observers to criticize Roosevelt for unnecessary risk-taking. Nevertheless, the Rough Riders became heroes to the American public and Theodore Roosevelt emerged as a national, as a major national figure. Theodore Roosevelt, they think that, well, he, he so desperately wanted to be in the military that he created his own military really to be part of. Um, there's a picture of him right there. There was a lot of jealousies by the United States uh, military, by the army, by the Navy. 
because uh, these guys got a lot of credit for for doing doing their work and probably they, it was minor compared to what the army and the navy did in the spanish american war but because theodore roosevelt headed this up it was big i mean this guy's a year away from becoming president of the united states he's out there you know uh on the battlefields and there's a remington uh painting right there and that's roosevelt on his horse charging up san juan hill at the end of the war a treaty was signed called the treaty of paris another treaty of paris here this is there'll be a few of them the u.s obtained cuba guam puerto rico and they paid spain 20 million dollars for the philippines and again you're gonna this is the controversy here why did we take cuba didn't in the teller amendment we say that we were going to give them their freedom and independence um, and the other question is, why are we paying Spain $20 million for the Philippines? If we won the war, why are we paying? Did we feel bad? Was it a lot like the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago when we gave Mexico $15 million for all that territory? Or is it a good gesture on our part? Again, it depends on what lens you're looking through. Um, the Secretary of State, John Hay, called it a splendid little war. There were only 100, it was only lasted 113 days with very few deaths. And most of the deaths came from malaria rather than bullets. Um, so again, a lot like this Mexican war, very similar in that Americans pretty much dominated. You finally had a little bit of uh, unity between the North and the South as they came together and fought a war and helped win this thing together. But no doubt about it, there was anti-imperialist debates going on. What are we doing taking Guam and Puerto Rico and the Philippines? They aren't attached to the United States. Is that the right thing to do? The presidents of Stanford and Harvard, very respected universities, obviously, with smart people running those institutions. The president says we shouldn't be doing this. Mark Twain, Samuel Gompers, Andrew Carnegie are all anti-imperialist. They're saying despotism, which is dictatorship, despotism abroad, away from home, might well beget despotism at home. So if we act like dictators other places, we, that might happen at home. So here's the three uh, periods of imperialistic debate. Louisiana Purchase, Mexican Session, and the Treaty of Guadalupe, Hildago, and then the Spanish-American War. Just looking at, did we, were we argued, should we take territory or, or should we not? And in all three cases, we decided to take that territory. A little bit about Puerto Rico, which we still, uh, it's, we still, it's a commonwealth of the United States today. Puerto Rico welcomed American intervention. They wanted us there. They're a poor country that appreciated our help. They maintain home rule, um, but it gives the, the Foraker Act that was passed gives Puerto Rico a limited degree of popular government. Uh, Puerto Ricans are born when they're born in Puerto Rico are immediately United States citizens and could come, come and go as they please. So, but they do not have a vote. They do not vote and they don't have representation in Congress. Um, so a little bit more, they, they uh, have their own constitution, they have their own governor, only pay federal income tax on work done within the United States, not in Puerto Rico. They pay into Social Security and have access to Medicare and Medicaid, but not some other government programs. They do not have a vote in Congress. They cannot vote in the presidential primary elections, but not, but not in, they can vote in primary elections, but not in the presidential election. And they're, as I said, natural born citizens. So Puerto Rico. Um, you could see here's Puerto, Puerto Rico down here. Um, here's Cuba, you know, off the coast of Cuba is Florida, 90 miles away. So that's where it is in relationship to the United States. Cuba, on the other hand, you know, we again said that in the Teller Amendment that we would give them back their freedom and independence. We will be true to our word. However, we're going to attach an amendment onto an amendment. We're going to attach the Platt Amendment onto the Teller Amendment that says, okay, Cuba, we are going to give you your freedom and independence. However, we're gonna maintain a base on your island, which we still do today. It's called Guantanamo Bay. Um, you're gonna to have to remain debt free and we, will, we declare that we will intervene anytime we want to. Here's why we were going to do that is because down south of Cuba, we're building the Panama Canal at the time. We're gonna be talking about the Panama Canal and how important that was to us uh, at the turn of the century. Uh, the first thing they had to do is they had to to uh, conquer yellow fever, and that's going to be with the help of a guy by the name of Dr. Walter Reed. Um, and they're going to they're going to 
not conquer it, but find out how to control the yellow fever. But the Platt Amendment, when we do give Cuba their independence, it, it does happen, but under certain circumstances, we reserve, <clears throat> reserve the right to intervene anytime we wanted to, and we kept Guantanamo Bay, which we still have, as I said. Uh, but Cuba is not, we don't own Cuba anymore. Same thing with the Philippines. Um, there were in, uh, there were de definitely some anger directed at the United States in the Philippines because they were really frustrated when they found out, well, wait a minute, we just exchanged Spanish rule for American rule. What's up with that? Why do we have to do that? So there was a lot of fighting, guerrilla warfare. Um, more Americans died in the fighting against the Philippines than in the Spanish-American War, way more. Uh, they were frustrated with the United States. After a while, though, um, things got better. Future President William Howard Taft was declared the governor of the Philippines, and he got along very well with the Filipino people. They grew to love him. He, uh, the United States set up schools, built roads, bridges, and hospitals, and the relationship got better. And eventually, we will give the Filipino people back their freedom and independence. It's going to be after World War II. All right. Um, imperialism in China. China, there's not a desire of the United States to take over China. However, there was a desire to trade with China. It's, a, it's an area that has a lot of natural resources. They don't have a military, so they're kind of an easy target. And other countries beside the United States are engaged in imperialism there. They're bullying the Chinese. I think it would be a good... Good way. The Chinese had always been like anti-foreign. They didn't want anybody coming in and they never would venture out. But people started finding out that China's country is rich in natural resources and they and other, uh, you know, countries are going to come in and try to take advantage of them. And this political cartoon is attesting to that famous French political cartoon from the late 1890s. A pie represents China and is being divided between characters of Queen Victoria of Great Britain, William uh, of Germany, um, Nicholas II of Russia, and, and the French Marianne, and the Magi Emperor of Japan. They're ca carefully contemplating which pieces to take. A stereotypical Chinese official throws his hands up and tries to stop them, but is powerless. It is meant to be a figurative representation of the imperialist tendencies of these nations toward China. And the United States is not going to um, be just stay out of this. They are going to get involved. As a matter of fact, when the United States, as they're growing in power and they're beginning to flex their muscles a little bit, declares all of China open to uh, anyone, really, they called it the open door policy. It was the elimination of what's called spheres of influence. You see these uh, different colors, Germany, green, you have the orange here with Britain. And, you know, there's parts of, of China that these uh, countries are going and controlling and no one else could control them. It's called a sphere of influence. This yellow sphere of influence is French controlled. Purple is Japanese. They are controlling these areas and they're not allowing anybody else to trade there. Well, the United States comes in and says, wait a minute, we'd like to trade in all those areas. So they, uh, Secretary of State John Hay wrote to these countries and said, hey, uh, you know, anybody could trade anywhere within China. <laughs> You know, so basically opening up all of China to trade and the United States really wanted to go in there. Well, next thing you know, all these foreigners start coming in. The Chinese people were not happy. Um, they, the young students of China uh, were started to rebel and they called it the Boxer Rebellion. Um, so young Chinese in Beijing, at the time it was called Peking, were rioting and the Americans uh, agreed to stop, help China stop the rioting, and they formed a coalition of countries, a multinational coalition that went in and stopped the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, the Chinese uh, were thankful to the United States for doing that. However, the multinational force charged China $300 million for their efforts, and but the United States, they didn't, they, they did, they, they told the Chinese that you could send kids over to the United States to be educated and don't worry about paying us for that. So yeah, the, uh, we helped stop the Boxer Rebellion.
Okay, let's talk about the election of 1900. It's a rematch of four years before. Remember uh, 1896, it was McKinley versus Jennings, gold versus silver. Things are going a lot better in 1900. Prosperity, gold standard, overseas expansion is what McKinley is promoting. And uh, the Democrats and Jennings, William Jennings Bryan, once again, talking about free and unlimited coins of silver, which is probably a pretty tired argument at this point because the economy is getting better. Uh, McKinley is gonna win up in the North. William Jennings Bryan's gonna win the South simply because he's a Democrat and Republicans don't win in the South, not until 1920, it's called Solid South. If you remember me talking about that. Uh, shortly after McKinley takes office for his second term, he's shot and killed by Leon Zalgis, who was an anarchist, believed in no government at all which is ironic because after the death of McKinley, it thrust onto the scene, one of the biggest big government presidents in American history, Theodore Roosevelt, who was McKinley's vice president. A little interesting side note here. It says here, Robert Todd Lincoln, son of Abe Lincoln, was present at the assassination of three presidents, his father's, President Garfield's, and President McKinley's. After the last shooting, he refused to attend any state affairs. He would not have been present at these events had it not been for the brother of John Wilkes Booth, who saved his life years earlier, pulled him off of train tracks as a train was coming when he was a little kid. So just one of those uh, interesting stories in history. Let's talk a little bit about Theodore Roosevelt. I'll talk more in class about Theodore Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents to talk about. No nonsense guy, youngest president in history of the United States at age 42. Um, he was a big advocate of a strong military and naval preparedness. His saying was speak softly and carry a big stick and you'll go far. Don't just go boast, just by your actions, take care of business. Speak softly, carry a big stick and you'll go far. For him, the big stick was the Navy. He called it his great white fleet. And, and you know, he's a former leader of the Rough Riders. Here's a, a famous remark made by one of his good friends, uh, British ambassador to the United States, Cecil Spring Rice. He said, the thing you have to remember about the president is that, is that he's about six, meaning he acts like he's six. Very am ambitious, very athletic, very funny, um, never stops talking, uh, just, just one of those kind of people. And, and again, I'll talk more about him in class. Some of the first for Roosevelt. In 1902, he became the first president to make a public appearance by car while in office. In 1904, TR became the first U.S. president to ride in a submarine. As the first nation's first uh, conservationist president, Roosevelt used his authority to establish National Forest Service in 1905. He created 150 new national forests, things like Yosemite and Yellowstone. In 1906, he was the first sitting president to take a trip abroad when he and his wife went to Panama to check out construction of the Panama Canal, which was very dangerous because people were dying from malaria. A month later, he became the first president to win the Nobel Peace Prize. And Roosevelt became the first president to dine with an African-American in the White House when he entertained Booker T. Washington. So a lot of Roosevelt first. I like to call him the honey badger president. And I will talk about what that means in class. Um, Roosevelt and his wife, Roosevelt's wife and his mother died on the same exact day, and it was Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1884. On February 14th, 1884, Theodore Roosevelt received terrible news. His wife and mother died within hours of one another in the Roosevelt house on, in New York City. His mother, age 50, succumbed to typhus, and his wife, Alice, died at age 22, giving birth to her namesake, her daughter, they named her Alice. The, follow, the following diary entry lovingly described his courtship, wedding, happiness, and marriage, and his grief over the death of his wife. And the, he simply put on February, on February 14th, the light has gone out of my life. He was very, very depressed after that. Um, here's a quote that I love, Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbled or where the doers of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is marred by death, the dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs and comes short again and again, who knows that great enthusiasms, the great devotions and spends himself, spends himself to a worthy cause, who at best know in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. 
so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who ne know neither victory nor defeat. And just sums up Theodore Roosevelt. Just basically go for it. Don't be the guy who sits back and just is a critic. Here's a, a picture of him. Uh, he was an avid weightlifter. You could see that. He had big barrel chest. Okay, one of his uh, lasting legacies as president is the Panama Canal. And uh, the Americans felt like they needed a canal uh, for to get, he wanted that strong Navy. He wanted the Navy to be able to go from the Atlantic to the Pacific quickly and not have to go all the way around the tip of South America. Uh, I'll get into more detail on this in class, but we purchased the rights to dig the Panama Canal from the French who had already started digging the canal, but their, their workers were dying of malaria and they didn't know why, so they quit. Um, so Roosevelt now uh, bought the rights to dig the canal from the French, so they're out. Now he had to go to the Colombians who own Panama and get uh, a, a treaty so that the Americans could start digging the canal. And Colombia wanted to hold out for more money and Roosevelt uh, basically instituted a coup by the Panamanians to get their freedom and independence from the Colombians. And that's how that went down. And that's how he got the rights to dig the Panama Canal. They figured out after a while that yellow fever was uh, caused by mosquitoes. It was Dr. William Gorgas and the work of Dr. Walter Wood uh, who uh, came to that conclusion. And finally, after digging this canal, um, and it took years and years, it took four, 13 years to, to dig the canal. Uh, the two proposals were one to go through Nicaragua or to go through the shortest distance between the Atlantic and the Pacific at the Isthmus of Panama, and that's what they decided right here. So they started digging this canal, and what they created were lock canals, where you raise a ship uh, up over the mountains, a man-made lake, Gatun at the top, and then you lower the ship down uh, the other way. It, it, their locks are like, you know, think of it as your bathtub. You put the stopper in, you turn the water on, and the water level rises in your bathtub. And they have this, here's a cruise ship going through. Uh, this is a man-made river called the Galliard Cut. This is uh, the big bathtub or the locks, they were called. So you raise the, the water up to this height, go to the next, uh, go to the next lock canal, and they go up and then down a number of different locks. You can see um, here as the ship is entering here, you can see that after the ship has entered, it, what it would look like, here's where they close the doors. Um, and once they close those doors, they start pumping water in and then on the other side, they would lower it. The ship is brought through, through with these mules, these, uh, I'll show you a closer picture in a minute here, but they, uh, you turn the engines off so it won't damage the canal. Here's a mule right here. And uh, this ship is in the canal. And there's a big container ship going through. There's a cruise ship going through, tight squeeze on the sides, you could tell. Here's the exit. You could see where it's here, and they're going to lower the water into the next canal and lower the water again. And then you're going to be on uh, exit from uh, Gatun Lake. And again, I wanted to put this picture in here. You can see just how, how close it is. The, the uh, canal zone has their own captains that captain each one of these ships. They don't allow the captain of the ship to go through the canal because they want someone who does this every day. They are expanding the canals. They're being expanded. I think it might be done now. Some political cartoons. You had Theodore Roosevelt was always, you know, on political cartoons. They used to love doing political cartoons on this guy. Um, here he is digging the canal and he's throwing dirt on Colombia, Bogota's capital of Colombia, basically saying, hey, you know, he, that he helped institute the coup by the Panamanians who got their freedom and independence from the Colombians. Uh, so we can dig the Panama Canal. Uh, they started to call the United States the policeman of the Western world. And here, you know, usually he's looked at as larger than life. You could see him riding this horse up the map or down the map from the U.S. down to South America and all and just bulldozing his way down to South America. Uh, Roosevelt came forward with his Roosevelt Corollary which basically was his declaration of uh, intervention in Latin American countries. Roosevelt uh, 
wanted to put his stamp on the on the Monroe Doctrine. That's what this basically is: is his stamp on the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe Doctrine stated, "We're we we're our own power. Stay away from the United States." And then they'll say, eh, "But when we want to, we'll intervene anytime we want, especially in Latin American countries." Here again, you know, you have Roosevelt with a cannon, and this little guy here. It says Colombia on his hat. Basically, Roosevelt threatening Colombia allowing Panama to get their freedom and independence. And it says here, he's got his hand around this guy's neck, it says Columbia, it says millions for the canal. And he's basically saying, you're gonna take it. Uh, Roosevelt became the first president to win the Nobel Peace Prize when he stopped a war, definitely benefited the United States, by the way, but Russia and Japan was fighting a war. And, uh, and you know, the, the Japanese, uh, came to the United States, sent an ambassador to Roosevelt, said, hey, can you stop this war? Japan was dominating the war, and but they knew they couldn't finish off Russia. Russia is sometimes hard to defeat because they get stronger as wars go on because they finally get all their population come together. It takes a long time to mobilize. And Japan knew that, and they wanted the United States to step in and stop the war while they were winning. That's They didn't say that, but that's what they were after. Roosevelt knew that too. So he stepped in, broke, brought both sides to Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and they signed the Treaty of, of Portsmouth that uh, led to the stopping of the war. Neither side was happy. The Japanese were upset because they didn't get enough. Um, the Russians began to see that what was happening, they knew that they could have possibly have won this war. Neither side was happy. Roosevelt was. He liked the fact that there was you know, two powers in the, in, uh, the East checking up on each other the Russians and the Japanese, they maintain the power of both of them, uh, you know, divide and conquer type attitude rather than a super strong Japan or a super strong Russia. And also he got the Nobel Peace Prize and he loved being front page of the newspaper. Okay, uh, I've talked about the gentleman's agreement before. Um, there were a lot of Japanese in the United States at the time, uh, in, especially in San Francisco. In 1906, the big year in San Francisco history, there was an earthquake and a huge fire. And it was, it was just a mess in San Francisco. They passed a decree in San Francisco uh, that Japanese children could not go to public schools. Uh, most of the schools were damaged and unusable after the earthquake and fire. Um, so they started trying to put schools in different places that, that did survive the earthquake and fire. And they were very limited space. So. San Francisco said, all right, no Japanese could go to school because we, the, the Americans are going to school. Uh, so Japan got upset. Uh, they're threatening the United States. And so th this is when Roosevelt stepped in and, and signed what's called the Gentleman's Agreement. And uh, he didn't want to seem weak, but he did say, okay, Japanese kids could go to school in San Francisco, but Japan had to agree to not send any unskilled workers to the United States. Unskilled workers, though, could go to Hawaii, but they could not come to the United States. Now, remember, we owned Hawaii at this time. So it was a way to allow children to go to school in San Francisco, but it definitely limited the number of Japanese that came to mainland United States because they had been saying that they had to be skilled. Not quite as severe as, say, Chinese Exclusion Act, which forbade Chinese from coming to the United States for over 40 years but along those same lines of controlling immigrants from coming in. Roosevelt didn't want to seem weak, so he sent battleships all on a tour around um, the world. And uh, is, he called it his Great White Fleet. The Root Takahara Agreement was signed um, between the United States and, and Japan. I'll talk about that later, but a little bit more about the Great White Fleet. He uh, sent them all the way around the world to show off, basically. That was very Rooseveltian right there. Um, so, and one of them, one of, the, one of the stops was in Monterey. This is a postcard right here. And it says here, with their white holes and buff upper works, the battleships of the US Navy must have looked much like a parade of gargantuan wedding cakes as they sailed onto Monterey Bay on May 1st in 1908. So it was a stopping point for them on their journey around the world. And that's the end of chapter, the full chapter 27.